this is not gonna be your average backend developer roadmap. I'm not gonna tell you to learn Python, Node.js, Java, Ruby, any of that stuff. We will be focusing more on the broader technologies and the tech stack you should know and figure out if there are any gaps in your knowledge if you already are a backend developer or what areas you should focus on if you're trying to become one. Also, if you're new here, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell icon to receive daily updates from CodeDam for tech, web development and more. Let's go. This video is a part of CodeDam's t-shirt giveaway program for the month. If you want to take part and win an amazing CodeDam t-shirt, all you have to do is leave a comment on this video about what you think and that's it, you are eligible. If your comment gets a heart from CodeDam, you will win a t-shirt for absolutely free. All right, let's start with the list of very important topics, which as a backend developer, you should absolutely, absolutely know. The first one, which probably nobody expects is HTTP. Not a programming language, not a database, not a cloud service, nothing, but actually through HTTP. If I give you a notepad, can you write a simple GET request without actually taking a look at how it works, I mean, in a network inspector. So if you have a simple notepad, or not even notepad, if I give you a curl CLI tool and tell you to send a raw HTTP request or using curl or using netcat or any, any certain tool, can you do that? If you can, I mean, I'm not telling you to remember the syntax, but I'm actually telling you that do you even know how to write an HTTP request? If not, then probably, chances are you probably don't understand the HTTP protocol. And what do I mean by that? In terms of not understanding, what is a method, right? What is a status code? What are headers in a request? How does the body work and how is body different from header? So you should at least have some level of semantic understanding of these topics, right? That is when you would be able to say that you understand HTTP protocol, hypertext transfer protocol, which is a plain text protocol. So you should be able to know these differences and what all these are as a backend developer. What are the content types, for example? If you are receiving content on the backend, is it URL encoded? Is it JSON? It's JSON type. Is it multi-part? Is it like, you know, you're uploading a file, then you need some that sort of content type. So these things you should be able to understand in terms of how they work, not only on a syntax level, but on a some sort of technical level as well as a backend developer. The second topic which comes to my mind is pretty close to HTTP, which we discussed, which is the REST, right? The REST architecture, which I think we have already covered a bunch of times. I mean, in, in a bunch of videos on GraphQL versus REST, and I think in the previous video as well, a bit. So REST architecture just states these few things, status codes and using the correct method name, for example, and how to create these REST APIs at the back end. So you should be familiar with these methods like put, patch, delete, and what's their use case and when you should use them and so on, right? Similarly, if you want, this is again, this is an optional technology, which is slash GraphQL, right? Which is technically not an alternative of REST, but I mean, it's it's pretty close, right? If you just start your backend in GraphQL, you don't really need to care about these put, patch, post, all this stuff. You only have to care about the schema and how your data is validated. So that is also something you should consider as a backend developer. Then of course, third thing which comes to my mind is a programming language, right? And HTML doesn't cut here. Unfortunately, this has to be a Turing complete language which you can run on a server, right? So obviously I'm not here to promote Node.js or Python or any other language. You can pick up any language you want. There are so many in the market at the moment. Rust, Node, Python, every single language works, right? There is no bad popular language. If a language is popular, it is probably has some good use cases. Pick up a language and try to connect your language basics to the HTTP protocol. Right? Writing a hello world program in Node.js or a print program in Python or a hello world in Rust is not going to teach you how to create HTTP servers. That is a whole another game because writing HTTP servers essentially means opening sockets on your operating system, right? So you need to have a bit of networking knowledge as well, which brings me to my next point, which is to actually know about networking and Linux fundamentals, which actually comes uh, networking comes under Linux fundamentals itself. But you should be aware about networking and Linux fundamentals as a backend developer because not only you would be working with the HTTP protocol, but in fact, you will be going three levels down to layer four, which is TCP protocol, right? And at this point, you would actually be communicating with databases as well, 
which have their own custom protocols and stuff like this. So you need to understand how networking works. What is TCP? What is HTTP? What are the differences between two? Till certain extent, I mean, not, not research level knowledge, but definitely operating system level knowledge, which allows you to understand what this stuff is. Then of course, the next thing which comes to my mind is obviously some sort of database. That could be a SQL, that could be a NoSQL database. That does not matter initially very much because what you would see is that NoSQL and SQL both follow a lot of common patterns, tell a lot of extent right? For example, indexing. Indexing is basically a concept which you have to understand irrespective of the database you choose, right? Caching is another topic which you should understand as a backend developer. Why caching is required, why disks are expensive than RAM, why networks are expensive than RAM and so on and so forth. So understanding about databases, understanding about caching, again, not to mention any technology, you can use Redis, Memcache, pretty much any technology you want, but really understand how these services work because as a developer, when the time comes, it will not be absolutely clear to you which technology you need to use. It will only be clear if you know about the solution space, what exists out there and what you can use. Falling on Redis and Memcache, you would often see that you are using something known as Elasticache on AWS for Redis and stuff. So again, not to stick to any particular technology, I would say learn about cloud providers, whether this is Google Cloud, whether this is Azure, whether this is AWS, pick any one which gives you maximum free credits or you can jump between them as well. But I would say just pick any one and try to embed yourself into that ecosystem, right? This embedding inside of ecosystem is important because fortunately or unfortunately, a bunch of them do have some proprietary technologies which results in a vendor lock-in, but also helps you do a lot of things faster, right? So you do want to have that, especially at a smaller stage. It's fine, it's okay to be vendor locked-in. But yeah, I mean, I would say like, especially when you're learning, try to use these cloud provider services at scale. For example, S3, S3 is, I would say S3 is very well a vendor lock-in solution because they don't charge you anything for uploading to it, but they have massive data transfer charges if you are downloading from S3. So things like these, right? So this is fine if you're doing it at a small scale, but you might want to reconsider or, you know, just, just see what you want to do if you are having a lot of data transfer, right? So, but anyway, the bigger point here is that you should pick a cloud provider and try to explore what all is possible, right? So instead of using Redis on EC2 and managing yourself, try to use a managed service. Instead of using a NAT gateway on an EC2, try to use a managed NAT on Maybe not because NATs are ridiculously expensive on AWS, but for other services like S3, it makes sense to try these services out. Number eight, and probably the most important thing, which most people never mention is web security. And I've made a video on this a few days back on top five things you should consider when you're doing web security and web security is like the most important thing I would say, like even if you skip cloud providers, if you, even if you skip caching, even if you skip DB, even if you skip all this knowledge, which kind of is lame because that will be a prerequisite for web security, this is the rock star. If you are creating a vulnerable server or if you are creating a vulnerable application, you just put everything at risk, right? Whatever you're doing, especially the database layer because code layer is not so fancy, right? The actual data, which the user data is, the user stuff is, that is the value, right? Anyone can code pretty much. I mean, today in today's time, if you give a bunch of computer science engineers from a college graduate to recreate Facebook, they could do that. But the data which Facebook has, that has value. And if you're writing bad code at an application layer, that what we discussed in that video, if you're writing a bad code on the business layer, or the logic layer, you pretty much are writing bad code for the world, which enables you for all sorts of attacks and data leaks and stuff. I mean, this gets messy. So you don't want to be writing SQL injections and you know, that sort of code. So make sure you spend a lot of time on web security and stuff and understand how and what are the common practices and best practices in web security. I would probably put number nine and number 10 in optional. So you can learn it if you want, containerization. And number 10, testing. Well, you can say they are optional, maybe not. Maybe you are someone who thinks that testing is super important. I do feel that is important, but I mean, you can, you know, just live a little without testing and containerization as well, till certain extent. So these are more high level production practices, 
But yeah, I mean, for containerization, again, not to mention any technologies, but Kubernetes is an overkill for most things, I believe, honestly. Docker is beautiful. You can use Docker for containerization. For testing, I would say pretty much the usual, the standard stuff, right? For backend, you could probably spin up a Jest configuration with some API testing or, you know, Postman-based testing as well. Some people do that. I don't, I mean, I don't have a lot of experience with Postman. But yeah, I mean, you can play around with these two technologies, but the crux, the meat of the thing are these rest of the eight things, which are super important, I think, as a backend developer. So these were top 10 broader topics, I believe are super important for you as a backend developer. And if you're missing out on any of these areas at the moment, I would say like take out some time and figure out what that area is and try to learn on that learn more about that. So that is all for this video. If you liked it, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel, do the comment, you know the drill. So that is all for this one. I'm gonna see you in the next video really soon.